Let's turn today to Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, and verse 39. And Jesus also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil is not above his teacher. But everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. In the previous verses, Jesus had spoken about what is commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount, given in much greater detail in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in Luke 6, 20 to 38, it's compressed into 19 verses. And at the end of it, he says these words, A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? What does that mean in the context of what Jesus had just spoken? The meaning here is that we cannot guide another person into the type of life that Jesus had described in these 19 verses if we ourselves are not walking along that way. What is it that gives us sight in the kingdom of God? It is obedience. It is through obedience to God's word that we get sight, not by intellectual understanding. Jesus himself said in John 7 verse 17, If a man is willing to do God's will, then he shall know of the teaching. It is only when we do that we understand or we get sight. Jesus himself did and then taught. We read in Acts 1 verse 1. And a blind man is one who understands perhaps, but does not obey. It is obedience that brings sight. And where a person seeks to teach God's word without obeying it in his private life, whether it is the Sermon on the Mount or any other passage of Scripture. Anyone who seeks to preach or teach God's word to others without obeying it in his own life is going to be like a blind man guiding other blind men who also don't obey God's word. What will happen? The leader will fall into a pit first, and the others will follow that leader into the pit. And so it's very important, first of all, if we are those who preach or teach God's word, that we obey and then speak what we have obeyed from God's word and teach. And if we are among those who are listeners, who are not teachers or preachers, but those who are being guided by others, then it's very important that we look for shepherds to guide us who we are convinced are obeying God's word in their personal and family lives. For only then can they have light and open eyes to know which direction they are going and be fit to be leaders for us. Further, in verse 40, Jesus said something further along this line, a pupil or a disciple is not above his teacher. Well, that's clear. It's a teacher who is above, in this case, Jesus himself is the teacher and we are the disciples. But everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher or reach his teacher's level. The aim is that we might be like Jesus or reach that level. It's fantastic when you begin to think of it, that Jesus desires that we might reach his level, as it says in the margin here. In the first epistle of John, chapter 3, and verse 3, we read these words. It's speaking about the second coming of Christ, that when he comes, we shall be like him, 1 John 3, 2. But it says here that every single person, every single believer, 1 John 3, 3, who has this hope, of the second coming of Christ, what does he do? How do we identify a person who has this hope? How do we know whether a person has this hope or not? He purifies himself just as Christ is pure. In other words, he is constantly cleansing himself, purifying himself, judging himself until he reaches the standard of purity that there is in his master and his teacher. This is the mark 
of a true disciple of Jesus. He purifies himself, he cleanses himself until he reaches the standard of his teacher. And that's exactly what we see here. It's a promise. Every disciple, Luke 6.40, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. In other words, we need to be trained before we can become like Christ. And we can say that the disciplines and trials of life and the chastenings that the Lord sends across our path are designed to make us like Jesus progressively more and more. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we are told that the Holy Spirit transforms us into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. It's not sudden. It's not instantaneous. It's gradual. It's in a gradual way, step by step, from one degree of glory to another, that we are conformed to the likeness of Christ. But it is God's will that we should be progressively transformed. And the thing that we need to ask ourselves is not, have I become like Christ? None of us have become like Christ yet. We shall be like him only when we see him. But what we do need to ask ourselves is this. Am I allowing the Holy Spirit to train me so that my life is a little more Christ-like this year than it was last year? And much more Christ-like than it was, say, ten years ago? Is the tone of my voice much more Christ-like today than it was, say, five years ago? If not, we are not on the road of sanctification. We're not walking on the highway of holiness. We're not allowing the Holy Spirit to train us. It says here, a disciple, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. We must submit, as the Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. What is the mighty hand of God? That is the trials and testings and chastenings that God sends across our path. And if we humble ourselves under them, we can be trained. Further, verse 41, Luke 6, 41. And why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? It's very easy in this process of training that the Holy Spirit takes us through to be taken up with finding out whether other people around us are being sanctified. And we could say that that is perhaps the easiest way to avoid being sanctified ourselves. If there is one absolutely certain way of missing sanctification altogether in our life, it's by judging others. Finding fault with others and concentrating on their weaknesses, meditating on the faults of others. Unfortunately, so many believers are preoccupied with this and they don't realize that they get into fellowship with Satan who is called the accuser of the brethren. How do we hold hands with the accuser of the brethren? When we begin to concentrate on the weaknesses and faults that we see in other believers. He says here, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye? He doesn't say there is no speck there. Jesus says there is a speck. There's probably a speck in everybody's eyes, more than one speck in most cases. But he says, you don't notice the log that is in your own eye. What is the log that is in our eye? Primarily, it is a judgmental attitude towards that brother who's got a speck in his eye. Maybe he's got a speck in his eye. Let's assume that a brother has committed adultery, which is a terrible sin. That's very serious. It's not to be taken lightly. Jesus said that even lusting in our thoughts is equal to adultery. Imagine if a brother has committed adultery in the flesh. But if you have a judgmental, critical attitude towards such a brother, Jesus says that compared to his adultery, your judgmental attitude is like a log and his adultery is only like a speck. I hope that gives us an understanding of the seriousness of a judgmental, condemnatory attitude towards others. When we judge and condemn others, we've got a log in our eye. And very often, those who are very quick at finding faults in others are those who have 
a thousand times bigger faults within themselves. And that's what the Lord is pointing out here. It's not that that brother's speck is to be ignored. But you certainly can't help him because you've got a log in your eye. Only a man who's got a loving, humble, compassionate attitude can help a brother who's got a speck in his eye. In fact, Galatians 6 verse 1 makes it very clear that if you see a brother who's been overtaken by a fault or one who's got a speck in his eye, as it were, caught in a trespass, who should help him? Who should remove the speck from his eye? One who is spiritual. And he should do it in a spirit of gentleness, considering whether he himself can be tempted. In other words, recognizing that you yourself have a flesh in which dwells no good thing. How can you say to your brother, Jesus says in Luke 6.42, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye. That sounds so spiritual. You are so concerned about the speck that is in his eye. But do you know the eye is a very delicate organ and if you go poking your finger into people's eyes, you can damage them, do more damage than the speck is doing. And so he says, you don't see the log that is in your eye. You hypocrite. You're not only one who judges others, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite because you see a fault perhaps in your wife and you don't see greater faults in yourself or vice versa. First, take out the log from your own eye. Get rid of that judgmental attitude. Get rid of that attitude where you don't judge yourself. And then you will see clearly. And when you see clearly, what can you do? Then you can help your brother to take the speck out of his brother's eye. So, the Lord wants the speck to be removed from his eye. But the only one qualified to do it is the one who has who is able to see clearly himself, who is obedient to the word, who is not like the blind person spoken of in verse 39. May God help us to be like that.